and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? Take heed that no man deceive you, and ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, for nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences, all these are the beginning of sorrows. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Muy bien. Very good. Gloria al Señor. Praise the Lord. Let's get into uh, a couple of things just to remind you. Much prayer in the way California has been hit. This is the town of paradise. Not so much anymore. Malibu. Uh, and this was uh, last night uh, yeah. down the street here on Riverside Avenue in the 15. Um, I got, uh, brother, uh, you text me, call me, a couple of brothers call me. And uh, it's been quite devastating in the Southern California area. Praise God that out here nothing happened aside from some brush and some uh, palm trees that were burning. But the, uh, it's threatening in other places as well. Of course, our California governor. And uh, legislative, thank you so much, have come out and said it is because global warming and it's because of CO2. So, uh, you know, you guys are producing too much carbon, uh, <laughs> carbon dioxide. So we, and our governor has come out and says, well, see, the problem is it's uh, carbon dioxide. We're going we're gonna to get hotter, half a degree in 10 years, another degree in another 10 years. And so... Um, well, let's ban all cars, right? Carbon dioxide. Let's bar, bar, ban all the cars. Uh, this is some of the uh, movie actors who lost their home. And um, forest fires have been absolutely terrible. Like Nobody talks about exactly uh, why these things are happening. Uh, there's a lot of mismanagement, water mismanagement, forest mismanagement, topsoil mismanagement within the, the city, within the state, I should say. A water problem, diversion of the water into the ocean, even though the water is needed in the soil. But more importantly, more than anything else, I, I believe in, in, in a very real way, God is getting a hold of a very godless state so that we can call out for mercy. I mean, God allows these things to happen. By the way, it's not global warming. Uh, uh, some sci scientists have come out already and said, you know, the lack of sunspots in, in the sun it leads to global cooling. We're actually in a global cooling environment. But don't tell that to Jerry Brown. He believes that it's absolutely global warming and he's going to tax you for it. So our next, uh, our next wonderful governor, Mr. Newsom, is going to take that on. Global warming tax because of all the fires. Carbon dioxide tax. So with that said, uh, Israel has been... Uh, pummel this week with close to 500 rockets that were launched from Gaza, which is the area of where the Philistines used to live, the area where Goliath was from, Gaza into Israel, into the areas close to Gaza, close to the Mediterranean, uh, chaos, injury, schools closed, no electricity. Of course, Iran has been supplying Hamas with quite a bit of rockets. Now, Iran is the same country that the U.S. has put an embargo on, has put some heavy, heavy embargo on them. And uh, residents of uh, the area close to Gaza and Israel will, are still in shelters and safe rooms. Uh, Hamas has been taking on the call to uh, destroy the government of Israel. Uh, the U.N. has done absolutely nothing, just like their name, United Nothing, United Nations. Security councils, they Amen. take no action, they said. No action needed, even though Israel, uh, some of the towns nearby look like what it, what it is, really a war zone. The Iranian fingerprints of these uh, close to 500 rockets is overwhelming. In fact, Qatar just recently gave 15, 15, $15 million to Hamas uh, and they turn it around for aid and for their people, turn it around, used it, and developed more weapons to shoot against Israel. And of course, uh, Israel has targeted 
uh, some of the headquarters of Hamas and their leaders. Hamas, of course, is, uh, the people in, Hamas, in Gaza have taken it to the streets, and uh, they're ready for fight. They're ready for a war. Uh, they are geared up for this. Remember, they have thousands of rockets between Hamas and Hezbollah. They have thousands of rockets ready to be launched against Israel. In fact, one of the articles that I've, that I've read, not only that 108 people are wounded in Israel after that, uh, Hamas has claimed victory, but one of the things that's very real to Israel is the next step is going to be Hezbollah, and they could be fighting a two-war front, meaning Gaza in the south, Hezbollah in the area of Lebanon. The, uh, the, um, the, the defense minister, uh, Lieberman, he resigned for Israel. He resigned because he believes that Israel is kowtowing to Hamas because they called for a ceasefire. Israel calls for a ceasefire. They did not want to go into and fight anymore. Lieberman was saying that if we don't fight now, if this doesn't continue, we are going to suffer major losses because the, uh, the IDF, the, the, the Israeli Defense Force, was ready to go into Gaza when Netanyahu called them back. And, uh, of course, the defense minister uh, resigned because he says he's, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu is capitulating to the terrorists. So there's a lot of things going on in Israel today. It's sort of an upheaval and in the balance because one of the reasons Netanyahu did not want to go fight in Gaza was because of the S-300 missile system that Russia has given to the terrorists, not only in Syria, uh, which they've been deployed against them, uh, in, in Russia can uh, scramble their airspace, so there's a lot of questions whether the IDF can even fly uh, outside of Israel anymore because of the Russian threat. And the other one that carries a lot of stuff is the fact that uh, Hezbollah has surface missiles ready to attack Israel, ready to attack Israel. So uh, if they face too much stuff in Gaza, they won't have enough power to face Hezbollah. Israel's in a very difficult state tonight, and uh, the United Nations is saying nothing. It's almost as if they're just going to let this play out, let Israel defend itself. At the same time, our president is calling for an immediate passing of the deal of the century. They said this is too much happening with Israel. The deal of the century, of course, is the peace plan that he wants to unveil. Now, the Palestinians do not want this deal. They believe it's very pro-Israel. Uh, Jason Greenblatt, which is the, uh, um, basically the builder of the plan, uh, says it will be announced soon, as well as his uh, son-in-law, Trump's son-in-law, uh, who's involved in the, in the peace accord, in the peace plan. Uh, basically, they want this to be passed immediately because of the situation going on in Israel. Now, with that, is ha with, with that happening, I, I texted, or I, I sent it out to a couple of guys um, earlier in the week. I think it was Sunday. I think I sent it to Roy on Sunday. The Sanhedrin, which is the body, the religious body in Israel, um, which basically they have tried to take control of Israel, even though, uh, I guess you could say maybe in 1948, they wanted nothing to do with Israel. Now that Israel's formed and and in the land, now they want to control it. These are the Orthodox religious Jews. The Sanhedrin, self-appointed. The ones that sentence our Lord. The one that sentenced Stephen. The descendants of those who, dis, uh, who stoned Stephen and came against Paul. They have called for the candidates that are running for mayor, for Jerusalem, two of them, to be ready for the third temple. To... Uh, they, they're issuing for them to put it in their platform that the third temple will be part of Jerusalem very, very soon. And to, uh, and to top the matters worse, they have called for them to um, make that part of their platform, to, to, to convey it to the people that this is coming, this is coming, the third temple is coming. Now the Sanhedrin has made it very clear through their reenactments of the temple services and the feast that they have reenacted. And the last one was the Rosh Hashanah and the Sukkot uh, World Creation Concert, 
that Jerusalem is ready for pilgrims to come. They're ready to host millions of people that will come to see the temple that will be rebuilt. So there's a calling for the temple. Now what's interesting is with the wars happening and the wars coming, whenever this happens, the fervency of the Jewish people gets more and more exciting toward the temple. They want this to happen. They believe, and, and many of them believe in the Orthodox community, that the Messiah is the only one that can give them the temple. So the expectation is that if the Sanhedrin are calling for the temple, that means the Messiah is about to show up. Now, Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9, which we read Daniel today, but not chapter 9. Daniel is praying. What is he praying for? Jerusalem, right? Very biblical, right? It's happening in our world today. Praying for Jerusalem. And then he reads the book of Jeremiah, chapter 29. And he realizes that the 70 years are almost up. They've been in exile for 70 years, and God had said that 70 years they would be in captivity. And he wonders, what's going to happen to Jerusalem? What's the future? We're in exile. The city's in ruined. Temple's in ruined. And God gives him this revelation. 490 years are for your city, for you and your city. Very, very much part of the Jewish, um, uh, the future of the Jewish people. 483 of them were successive, consecutive years, until the Messiah, the, the prince, and the Messiah would come and he would be cut off, not for himself, but for others. And when the people of the prince who is to come destroys the temple, there will be a a treaty of some sort, a covenant, a, a peace, I wouldn't say a peace accord, they call it a peace accord, but it's really just like a covenant. Something is done with the Jewish people. He will make a covenant with them for seven years, which is the last part of the 490 years, or the last part of the 70th, uh, of the 70 weeks that have been uh, allotted to Israel. So if you multiply 70 times 7, you get 490 years. 483 were consecutive. It ended when Jesus was crucified. Seven of those remain. So if you want to put it in weeks form, right, in the form of weeks, 69 have been fulfilled. There's the one week left, 70th week of Daniel. Now, don't think of weeks as in seven days. Shabuam in Hebrew means sevens. It literally just means sevens. Now, it could be seven days, it could be seven weeks, it could be... The context tells you it's years, 490 years, 70 times 7. 69 have been fulfilled, one week left. That covenant with this prince who is to come, that was quite interesting, in Calvinist reform circles, the one who makes the treaty with, or the covenant with Israel, they say, is Jesus. Right? In Calvinistic reform circles, chapter 9 of Daniel, the one who makes the treaty with Israel, they say is Jesus. And he makes it in three and a half years, he breaks it, and since Jesus' ministry was three and a half years, that's the ministry of the gospel. The Jews are now no, have no part of it. They rejected Jesus. It's, it's unbelievable how they changed it. Jesus never made a treaty with the Jewish people for seven years. He never broke anything at the three-and-a-half-year mark. We're talking about something that the context tells you who it is. When you see the prince right, who's to come, the one who destroyed the temple, the people of the prince who destroyed the temple, when you see that prince coming, that is Antichrist. Who destroyed the temple during the Romans? Right? The Romans did it. Titus sent out his, his troops. 70 AD, they destroyed the temple. Well, I'm not saying the Antichrist is going to be Roman. Could be. But he certainly makes it possible that it's going to be a Gentile. A Gentile ruler, like the one who destroyed the temple. Well, who also destroyed the temple? Who else destroyed the temple? We read that today. Babylon, right? Babylon, another Gentile ruler, destroyed the temple. Someone else in that character, in that form, is going to come and he's going to trick the Jewish people into believing 
that he is their Messiah, he is their hope, and they're so desperate for it that they would believe it and make it and take it. And of course, Daniel says, wars and desolations are determined until the end. This is not the end of it all. Jesus told us, when you see wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, famines, know that it is not the end. Don't be afraid of it. These things must take place. Right? There's amazing things Jesus said. They must take place. Now, now just a question for everybody here. How do, you, how do you grab that word when it says it must take place? What does that tell you about the words of Jesus? They must take place. It's going to happen, right? Yeah, the necessity of it. Did the cross, you know, did it must happen? You know, did the cross have to happen? Yes, in the same way, these things must take place. They must happen. You can't stop it. I can't stop it, right? But he says, don't be afraid, right? The end is not yet. We're not to lose sight of the bigger picture, is what Jesus is saying, right? Which is the bigger picture is at the end of that chapter. He comes, right? In the midst of all this, he encourages us to not to lose hope, not to take a back seat to it, not to be afraid. And he goes on to explain that the church is going to take the gospel to the ends of the earth before the end comes. In the midst of difficulties, trials, persecution, false prophets, and the apostasy. In the midst of all that, he says the church will get smaller, more refined, and duty-bound to go into the ends of the earth and preach the gospel. It will be a refined church, a more powerful church, a more serious church that will take the gospel to the ends of the earth. That's what Jesus is going to have at the end of the day. And that's what Paul said, those who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. Right? Those who are alive and remain, there'll be, there'll be tremendous difficulties for Christians during the time, but not to lose hope. Now, the Jews are looking for this, and the EU wants to give it to them. Mr. Emmanuel Macron, the Prime Minister of France, would love to be the broker of this peace deal. In fact, him and Trump have been going at it for quite a few weeks, you know, jabs at each other. It's quite comical to see you know, two people with great egos <laughs> going at each other. Um, and of course, Macron says, hey, look, you got so much time, and I'm going to issue my deal. And you got a, a, a French European leader ready to roll out not only an EU army, which is interesting, an EU army, a European Union army, um, Angela Merkel, seeing the picture there, the Prime Minister of Germany, um, vowing for him, making sure that it, it happens. They're delighted that it happens. And it's reminding a lot of people <coughs> when Napoleon was the last one to call for this. Now, what's interesting about Napoleon the Holy Roman Emperor. Remember, he wanted to be the Holy Roman. He was crowned the Holy Roman Emperor. He wanted to return Europe to its original Roman ideal, to have a Caesar, to have a Holy Roman. And Christians, Christians in England during this time, believed that Napoleon was the Antichrist. They really believed that Napoleon was the Antichrist. He had fought the battles. He was overcoming. He was winning battles, he was restoring the Jews, and he was calling himself the Holy Roman Empire, Emperor. And so, in a very interesting way, Mr. Macron has called himself a god. He's called himself a god. He calls himself, he's the reincarnation of Jupiter, one of the Roman gods. Now, we think he's crazy, but he believes it. It's another story. Mm -hmm. And he wants to rule Europe, calling for an EU army. And he says, we're going to defend even against the, uh, the U.S. This army is going to challenge China, Russia, the U.S. And, of course, he wants to bring a deal to the Jews. They have an interesting character here. He wants to control Europe, the emperor of, of, of Europe. He wants to be like an ultimate ruler, believes he's a god. 
uh, came out of nowhere, in a sense, to win the election. And now he's calling for a peace plan with the Jewish people. Of course, he wants to regulate the internet as well. It's quite of an interesting thing. Um, he wants to, Europe to become an empire, to sanction uh, the US, and to sanction social media and censor anyone that does not comply with his rules. And he's met with Facebook. He's met with so the social medias to control it. Um, this new regulations is to protect us, he says. Don't be alarmed. This is here to protect you. It's for your own good. <laughs> we heard that before, right? It's for your own good. Uh, and announcing new pilot project, he says, with antisocial network, meaning that he wants to have his own credit system or social rank ranking in Europe, just like China, just like other places. They want to rank European citizens. Now, it's quite interesting that Instagram this week has decided to ban uh, Bible verses or Bible articles from some of their platforms. And, um, and of course, Google, our very friendly friends, says that free speech is disastrous for society. Uh, when you hear free speech, I don't know about you, but when I hear free speech, I hear freedom to preach the gospel. Right? That, that's to me, that's what it is. Um, because it always came together with it. You can't, free speech has always been part of America being able to share the gospel freely. Even in the most difficult circumstances, the free speech laws always protected preachers, evangelists, church members, that we can share Christ with anybody, and we're protected by this free speech. Well, the, the governments of Europe, the governments of Islam, the governments of uh, uh, technocrats, do not want this to happen. Do not want this to happen. Now, switching gears, uh, we were talking about abortion earlier. And uh, I have seen a lot of Planned Parenthood ads, but I have never seen something so creepy and so demonic as to this one. It looks unbelievably beautiful. And there's nothing wrong with the baby. It's wrong in how it's used. I want you to be the judge of it and listen to, or read, I should say. Read what, it's, what, what they're saying about babies. This is their new ad. This is, they're coming in not with, not with the baby in the womb anymore. Baby's outside. It's, it's a beautiful baby girl. right? Unbelievable. They're calling for infanticide. They're calling for babies out of the womb to be a choice. Now, there's a lot of things this baby needs to be, and that's she needs to be loved. She needs to have a family. She needs to be taken care of and defended and protected. And nowhere uh, she is more at risk than Planned Parenthood, which continues to push the envelope. In fact, the LA Times came out this week defending the idea of dismembering the limbs of babies while they're being aborted. This is a newspaper editorial defended this gruesome procedure uh, in the second trimester, second trimester, being torn limb by limb, um, according to the LA Times. Now, uh, we have some good news in a sense of uh, Alabama has chosen and have uh, voted for very conservative judges who are calling the um, Alabama and West Virginia, calling abortion unconstitutional. And they're taking it up to the Supreme Court. It may be, it may be Judge Kavanaugh's first case to be dealt with. In fact, it may be the DACA one, it may be the, the immigration one, but this one for sure is going to get up there. So it's going to be really interesting knowing that 
Ruth Bader Ginsburg is on her last, uh, last hurrah. She broke some ribs. She's 93. Um, in my opinion, she should just retire. And uh, I won't tell you what else, but maybe she can go and have her eternal reward soon. And, um, but that's for the Lord to decide. All I know is that um, she would not vote for um, she would not vote for this baby to be born. She would vote for this baby to be a choice. Um, but more to that to come. I mean, we had some amazing, uh, amazing testimonies this past week when we went to pray uh, at the Planned Parenthood nearby uh, here. Uh, switching gears again, the UK government has gone full, full onslaught on government uh, in Privacy Act that they were going full Orwellian, meaning that the, you know, the Orwellian idea in 1984 to inspect and to observe not only, now take a look at this, not only facial recognition, DNA, fingerprinting, voice uh, recognition. Uh, they have, uh, London is already the, the, the place that has the most cameras, but they have been using this for quite some time. The problem is, they're inefficient, 90% inefficient. So why do they keep using it? Well, this, uh, this idea that they're using it for the safety of others, it's, it's wrong. It, it's, they're, they're not using it for the safety of others. What they've been doing is they're gathering data. High-profile government agencies have a, uh, basically has recorded uh, voice recognition, voice print, facial structure, iris and retina templates, and basically have targeted people that, what they called a low risk score, low risk score, which means that um, the council data from housing, education, social services, benefits, and debt uh, have a profile. You have a profile of all those things, and they're even used to predict if a person is at risk. So based on your profile, you could be a criminal. Well, we gotta make sure you don't commit crimes. Yeah, you ever watch that movie? What was that? Minority Report. Well, it's not so far-fetched. Now, they target homeless. They target people with mental disabilities. And they targeted people that they consider a threat, which could be like an antisocial behavior. Well, what's an antisocial behavior? <laughs> what, what, what would a government consider an antisocial behavior? I don't, I don't know if it could be. Well, yeah. <laughs> Remember we're talking about Daniel, right? And he was praying, and it was saying that it was that law passed. Well, they leave it so open, antisocial behavior. Well, that could mean that if, some, if you post a threat to somebody because you told something to someone and they caused a reaction. It's an antisocial behavior. So anyway, they're collecting this data to such a degree that uh, Britain is very, very concerned. They've also developed what they call robots that can fly over London and just watch the population, they are AI, they're autonomous, which is very scary to think. They're autonomous, meaning that they are, they're not bound by human choice, meaning if they see something, they can act on it based on their own algorithms, meaning that a, a person is not flying them and going, should we do this or should we not? It's going to be the AI who's going to make that decision. Quite interesting. Now, our U.S. government has already come up with these ideas of um, turning insects into weapons. Now, this is, this is quite fascinating. DARPA, our lovely friends from DARPA. Controversial projects. If you want the article, I'll send it to you. Now, this is, this is news already. It's not, it's not, you know, no one's making this up. Insects, robotic AI insects, have been created, they've been created for some time. Now the original point was to battle against pests. So if there were some, let's say, an overpopulation of locusts, these, uh, these, these uh, animals will be there and uh, these insects will be deployed in those areas and they would get rid of the overpopulation of locusts. And it helps farmers and it helps other people that have an overpopulation of certain bugs, right? However, DARPA aims to achieve uh, de delivering these uh, insects uh, with engineered viruses and mutations that can be passed to plants and others, making it harder 
uh, making it, I'm sorry, hardier or resistant to biological attacks. However, to some people, the idea of using insects as farming tool isn't as innocent as it sounds because they can also be weaponized against other people. And so there's a huge controversy because who's going to make those decisions? Now, the UK government says we are, our government incognito says they are, although it's not come out very clear as to who can make that decision. We know the transhuman revolution is continuing. I have this article, and you, you ought to read it because it's called What It Is. What is transhumanism? What is AI? And this is, listen to the other part, how to prepare for its arrival. It's not a thing of if, it's a thing of when. And I've told my wife, just in jokes, I said, you know, the next time we go out, because it may be a few years the next time we go out, just a joke, no offense, yeah. Um, just because of our schedule, yeah, well, please. <laughs> um, next time, it'll be a waiter who's a robot. Quite interesting. Neuroplasticity, plug and play for our brains. Transhumanism believes that uh, with the neuroplasticity, uh, um, uh, you could actually tr teach your brain how to do certain things. They could learn how to new skill. And if you add a new thing to your body, it could actually learn that. Now, I, I brought this last time, but here's some of the books that uh, I believe as Christians we ought to know what they say. I don't say read them if you don't want to read them, but if you do read them. Uh, Dan Brown's Origins, right? Um, Life 3.0, and of, co of course the ones I've been talking about the most is Homo Deus by uh, Mr. Noah Harari, Hebrew University. Uh, Life 3.0, it's uh, by a, a, a professor at MIT, which are discussing a life, um, get ready for a life with AI. Now we already use AI, most of our world is already included with AI just by the choices we make in terms of GPS and things like that in your own life. And those, I believe in a very real way, are, are make our life easier, simple. There's an AI technology that it uses uh, to help autistic kids. There's an AI technology that helps with that. And I don't think there's anything, as, as a Christian, anything wrong with that. However, we're not dealing with that here. We're dealing with artificial, general intelligence where it's a replacement of humans for something smarter. So just like we evolve from the animals, they say, AI will evolve from humans. And just like we overlook the animals, we're dominant over the animals, this will be dominant over us. Now, this is what they're saying. I'm saying it's going to happen right away. But this is what people read. Millions of copies have been sold. The future of transhumanism, they say, is now. They say, well, if people are biohacking their bodies anyway, why don't we regulate it? Now, biohacking has gone on for some time. People have put RFID chips in their bodies. People have put in magnets in their bodies, identification chips in their bodies already. People have put uh, antennas in their bodies to get better Wi-Fi reception. You don't need to go to a Starbucks anymore. Now, this is what people have done. It, it's... it's they biohack their body. You can, you can read articles upon articles of people that have done this. It's kind of a trendy thing, they say. If you want to get into your house, you don't want to use, use a key, you can actually get a system that I can actually unlock your door with magnets put in your body. That's kind of cool, isn't it? Well, they say it's so part of our society. Now, why don't we just regulate it and move into the next step, which is to control it with your brain, Neuralinks. And you can actually control all these things through your brain. I think I have a video of it pretty soon. And that's will be the last of it because we're running out of time. Uh, by the way, British companies are implanting microchips in their employees already. They came out this week that several, several companies in England um, already plant, implanted chips into their employees. It's a convenient and security uh, it provides convenience and security for their employees. Uh, the company is called Biotech. There's another company called Biohack. There's one in Wisconsin. There's uh, several in Sweden. Now, this has created a lot of problems because of security reasons. Now, remember, 
America has a very strict privacy laws. China doesn't care. Europe is starting not to care. <laughs> uh, how is that in Australia, Davey? No good? OK, they don't care. All right, it's the same idea. Now, the privacy laws, of course, speaks of these uh, implants on microchips uh, on, on, your, on your body. And you can see it here. This is, this is a trendy thing. It used to be shocking to see this. Not so much so anymore. Now, the uh, trade unions and, and some people in Britain, some of the companies, the biggest employer organization in Britain, have sound the alarm, say, look, they're going to find out not only if we're working, <laughs> but they're also going to be find out if we go to the bathroom. They're going to find out a lot of things about us. And, and if we go home, they'll know where we are. They'll, you can't take a day off anymore. You, you can't call in sick anymore, that kind of thing. So anyway, according to The Guardian, Biotech is one of several firms that is uh, hiring to implant RFID microchips, meaning that when you get the job, it comes with a chip. And if you don't want the job, you don't get the chip. Or if you don't get the chip, you don't get the job. <laughs> now let's, let's look at the video very quickly. Um, Moving on to our top international story this hour, we are following some disturbing news out of the tech world. As this week, the Confederation of British Industry, or CBI, issued a warning about the future of microchips in the workplace. According to The Guardian, a British company has already fitted 150 implants in the UK alone. Biotech's chips, according to its website, quote, store a range of encrypted personal data from bank account details and passwords to medical data or Bitcoin wallet details. The device is implanted between the thumb and forefinger, and depending on which kit you choose, costs between 90 and just over $330. The CBI, which represents 140 trade associations and 190,000 businesses, told The Guardian, quote, while technology is changing the way we work, this makes for distinctly uncomfortable reading. Firms should be concentrating on rather more immediate priorities and focusing on engaging their employees. The organization is concerned that employers could eventually force workers to be chipped the way you may chip your pets, for example. The Secretary General of the Trade Union Congress in the UK added, quote, microchipping would give bosses even more power and control over their workers. There are obvious risks involved and employers must not brush them aside or pressure staff into being chipped. Now, you might be thinking such concerns sound hyperbolic, but you would actually be sadly mistaken. Believe it or not, companies have already started microchipping employees. For example, a cafeteria kiosk producer in River Falls, Wisconsin, chipped employees last year. There are governments that run central banks. So they were the first, one of the first ones to call us to say, uh, we've got to control our employees and we, we need to have certain access levels and we can't have that compromise. And they saw that as a solution. They need that. They need those controls. Joining us now with the future of microchipping in question is former UK Member of Parliament, George Galloway. All right, George, how difficult is it really to remember banking information? I mean, do you think average people really want these chips? Well, I'm sure not. I mean, beasts are branded and slaves are enchained. Uh, this is, I suppose, the next stage. The wage slave will be microchipped. And the employer, imagine Amazon, just for an example, other brands are available, employing half a million people, every one of them, one day perhaps microchipped. So the company will not be able just to employ you at rock bottom rates. It will know how long you went to the toilet for electronically. Uh, I might even know what you did there. It is uh, grotesque. It is obscene. It is, on the face of it, ridiculous, except, as you've just pointed out, it's already happening. And even here in Britain, it's happening. It's happening in the United States. It's happening in the tech industries already. And, of course, it's all very well saying it's voluntary. But when you're a wage slave, voluntary doesn't mean much. If it's get this job and sign up for the chip or don't get the job, well, people will take the chip. What concerns do you have about this technology, and are you confident in the British government's ability to regulate these chips? 
<laughs> I wouldn't be confident in the British government's ability to regulate fish and chips, never mind <laughs> microchips. And indeed, the British government might be gone by the end of the week. No, I am not at all confident. But it is come to something when the CBI, which is the employers, the bosses organization, are expressing their anxiety and unease about this move. The trade union opposition to it will be absolute. But we know from recent times that what starts out as resolute opposition incrementally becomes the prevailing orthodoxy. And it would be uh, an Aldous, it would be a dystopian Aldous Huxley future if that's how we all ended up chipped by our employer. I want to ask you one more question unrelated to this. Tea. Uh, RT News, and the title of this was The Mark of the Beast, which was really interesting to me that a secular uh, news outlet, as Russian television, would actually call this. And unbelievers understand that there's something amidst going on here, and they understand that Revelation 13 speaks about this. Now, this in itself, it's not the mark of the beast. This in itself is not it. It is related, um, um, the, the, the mark of the beast is related to worship of the Antichrist and worship of the image of the beast, but what we see happening already is the desensitization of people's mindset and understanding that chip is part of our culture, part of our society, part of work, part of economic uh, power, part of security, and it will be part of our world, and, and it looks like it's not going back to anything like it. Can you imagine the day that you would see it on TV? And I mean, you read about it when you were a kid, and you heard about it when you were growing up and people made fun of it all the time but boy even unbelievers are quoting revelation 13 so you know it sounds a lot like what the book of revelation is about yeah it could move very yeah, that's right it could be it could be a transition at that point yeah at that point it will become that and and so it, it you know christians are having to make some tough decisions in our world today Oh, yeah, it is be sold as that. Now, it'll be implemented, of course. We see that in Revelation 13 by the beast, by the false prophet, by the image of the beast. And it's something that we see it in our world. We see it already in our world that our kids see this. They understand this is happening. And uh, uh, more and more, our world is going into that direction. We're going to finish real quick. Um, I was going to talk about this, but we'll let it go. This is... a. Uh, 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 undercover organizations or undercover videos of organizations that teach migrants, not only in Europe and America, to lie to uh, police, border police, to tell them that they're Christians that are being persecuted. The only reason why I brought it up is because they, they, they've actually caught organizations like NGOs who are getting uh, immigrants into countries like Europe, the United States, and saying, we're, we're, we're Christians and we're being persecuted. And then they apply for asylum. They're being coached. They're being told what to say. They're being told what to do. They're giving false information in order to pretend to be Christians who are being persecuted. Uh, one last thing, and this is about Asia Bibi. My friend of mine, a friend of mine who lives in the UK, they had a prayer meeting where he was able to preach and teach as well regarding the concern of Asia Bibi. She's not being allowed to go into certain countries. The UK has blocked her. They don't want the controversy. The US has not uh, made a decision. They have not allowed her to come. Pakistan, it is, uh, have completely gone into um, basically protest and burning cars and persecuting other Christians because of the vote by the Supreme Court not to kill Asia Bibi. So they're calling for the, uh, for the Supreme Court to, to step down. Uh, this is creating a tremendous chaos. I encourage you guys to get a hold of uh, our government, uh, either Mike Pence, either Mike Pompeo, uh, the Pakistan Pakistani embassy in Washington, D.C. Uh, there will be a meeting tomorrow in Washington, D.C. It's a little too far for us, but we can certainly join them in prayer between 6 and 7 p.m. Eastern time for Asia Bibi. They'll be meeting in front of the Pakistani uh uh, embassy to pray and to urge the, the, the embassy to um, give mercy and asylum to Asia Bibi as a Christian who's being persecuted 
uh, for blasphemy laws in Pakistan. So with that, I think we should pray. Uh, there's some good news coming out of Iran, and that's the last part of it. Uh, as much as the persecution has continued, uh, the, the Christians, about three million of them, um, who've been isolated and been very fearful, are growing. And this is one message that they have in, in Iran. God is very much alive in Iran. He's moving, and he's building his true church, and it is growing. And there's a lot of good news that is happening in our country, despite all the other uh, oppression and military stuff that's been going on with them. There are Christians in Iran, in prison, obviously, some in hiding, but it's growing. And it's something that we need to take courage in the fact that as we pray for the persecuted church, they are continuing to grow and they're continuing to represent Jesus in a very difficult place, uh, Iran, today. So pray for Asia Bibi, pray for the persecuted church. We had a whole service on prayer for the persecuted church. Remember them in your prayers, and we shall pray right now. Lord, in the name of Jesus, your son, we thank you for uh, the news that we have heard. Lord, let it not fear come into our hearts and minds, but let it be, Lord, a, a sound mind, love and discipline, Lord, that we would take these news and be able to put them in our hearts, Lord God, in such a way that it will propel us to go forward in our walk with you, in our service to you, Lord, and our love for one another, and our ministering, ministering the gospel to the lost. Lord, these news should encourage us that, that, that your soon return um, will be, um, Lord, visible for all the world to see, and we will be, uh, Lord, with you forever and ever. And it gives us courage, knowing that soon, Lord, no matter what happens in this world, we will be together with you. Lord, give us more time as we pray for more time so people can hear your word. But also, Lord, we pray for protection upon your people, upon Christians throughout the world, upon the persecuted believers, Lord. And also, Lord, we pray for your ancient people, Israel. We pray that they would see the truth of the gospel of Jesus in the face of Jesus. They would know him as Messiah, as their Savior. Lord God, please don't let them be deceived by what Satan has for them, Lord. But rather, Lord, that, that they would turn to you. Lord, we pray for individuals that would be saved in the, in the army, the IDF. But we pray also for their government, Lord, and for their leaders, as well as for our leaders. Lord, we know history is it's winding up, and we know, Lord, the things that are written in Revelation and in Daniel and in Zechariah are about to take place. Please, Lord, help us to be ready, to be able, and to be willing to follow you, even to the ends of the earth, Lord. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.